love and respect Buddha Vida mi gente thanks for tuning in once again appreciate you taking the time to do that got a great story here another unsung hero we're just talking about the black warrior or in other words Tascalusa or Chief Tascalusa and his encounter with Hernando de Soto I know many of you already know the story or you've seen shorts on it, but I wanted to read some of the primary sources so we can get some of the full story here and to see exactly what these chroniclers uh, wrote down exactly. So I hope you guys enjoy. We're going to start with uh, this book here. It says Hernando de Soto and Florida or record of the events of 56 years from 1512. To 1568 by Barner Ship. That's from 1881. Even though we're going to read the primary source from this book, doesn't mean this is the only uh, book that writes about this account or this part of Hernando de Soto's journey through the Southeast. But this is a pretty good one here. So we're going to go to uh, volume two. It says here History of the Conquest of Florida. And we go to the second part of that volume, uh, chapter 5, page 376 in this book. So there's many books inside this uh, book, actually, we're reading. It's a compilation of a lot of different primary sources. And we're going to go ahead again and read uh, chapter 5. It says, the manner in which Tuscaloosa, it says, but it's Tuscaloosa, received the general. The general sojourned. So when they say general, they're talking about Hernando de Soto. So we're picking up middle of their journey here, right, guys? They've already been on other towns. They've already encountered other caciques. And now they're going and reaching the territory of Tuscaloosa and actually encountering Tuscaloosa. It says here, the general sojourned 10 days at Palasi. Palisi. Tennessee, Tallahassee, where he inquired about the neighboring provinces and the journey he had to make. In the meantime, the son of Tuscaloosa visited him. He was a young man about 18 years of age, but so tall, all right, so tall that he exceeded in height by nearly half of his body. All the Spaniards and all the Indians of the army. Do you guys hear that? So these Spaniards including Hernando de Soto, because he included himself there, and the Indians they were traveling with, he's saying they were nearly half the size of the son of Tuscaloosa, meaning he was very, very tall. Some would call him a giant. Let me repeat that part again. So he was so tall that he exceeded in height by nearly half of his body, all the Spaniards and all the Indians of the army. He had in his suit many important persons and came in the quality of ambassador to offer to Soto the friendship of his father, his person, and his province. Soto received them also with much politeness 
as much for the personal merit which he seemed to possess as for his appearance which had something noble. Afterwards, when the young lord learned that the general wished to visit Tuscaloosa, he told him that his father was but twelve leagues from the camp and that they could go there by two routes, that he begged the general to send some soldiers to reconnoitre them with orders to go by one and return by the other, that he would have them conducted there and brought back in safety, and that afterwards they could march by their route the most agreeable and the easiest. Villabos, who expected that the expedition would be fortunate, offered to go with one of his companions to Tuscaloosa. On his return, the Spaniards bade adieu to Cusa and his subjects. So they were coming from the town of Cusa and the, they were chilling and hanging with the chief of the Cusa. And so they took the route that Villabos indicated to them. They crossed the river Talesi upon rafts and boats. And at the end of three days, they arrived in view of a little village where Tuscaloosa awaited them. But when he learned that they were approaching, he went to meet them and stopped upon an eminence, the better to see them. He was surrounded by a hundred of his principal subjects. So when they mean stopped upon an eminence, they meant he was on top of a mound. He was in a high place on top of a mound, the better to see them. He was surrounded by a hundred of his principal subjects, all standing while he was seated upon a wooden chair, about two feet high, without back or arms, and all of one piece. Near to his chair, there was an Indian with an ensign of chamois skin traversed by three azure bars of the shape of a cavalry ensign. Our people were surprised at it, for they had not yet seen flags among the Indians. Do you guys hear that? They saw a flag, like a cavalry flag. The Indian who was standing next to Chief Tuscaloosa had it on. Again, they were like, wow, we are surprised at it, for they had not yet seen flags among the Indians. Tuscaloosa was 40 years of age, or thereabouts, and two feet higher, listen to this, guys, and two feet higher than those who accompanied him. So that he appeared a giant. He was a giant. Meaning he was two feet taller than all the rest of the Indians and his son. Two feet taller. Imagine his son was already tall. And so Tuscaloosa even taller. So that he appeared a giant. He was a giant. Guys, so when they're finding all these giant skeletons in the mounds. This is what I was saying. These are just some of the Indians a lot of the time. His face, his shoulders, and the rest of his body corresponded with his height. And he was large in proportion, a handsome man of proud and noble men, the best formed and greatest that he had yet seen in Florida. While he was awaiting Soto, upon the eminence or upon the mound, some Spanish officers proceeded as far as to him without his dining to look at them or show them the least civility and he pretended as though he did not see them but on the arrival of the general he arose and made 15 or 20 steps to receive him soto on his part dismounted and embraced him they conversed together while the soldiers were taking lodgings in the village and the environs afterwards they went hand in hand to the house which was prepared for the general where the cacique took leave of him and retired the army refreshed itself two days in the village, and the third it left Tuscaloosa, under pretext of friendship and service, wished to accompany it during its march over his lands. Therefore, Soto commanded that they should have ready a horse for this cacique. All right, so they're kind of writing this. Uh, you guys are going to read it in another version. De Soto was demanding all these Indians, supposedly, to ride with him demanding almost like servants so De Soto was like alright yeah get him a horse you know get it ready for the chief the same as they had done until then for all the other Indian lords which I had forgotten to mention so this is what I was saying we're going to read 
he had other casicas working for him. That's how he was able to travel in a lot of these parts. He traveled with some of the casicas. He kind of forced them, and then he would let them go. But as Tuscaloosa was large, they had trouble to find a steed for him. You guys hear that? He was a giant. Nevertheless, when they had searched well, they found a large pack horse. They put him thereupon. After having given him a scarlet dress and cap of the same color, but his feet lacked very little of touching the ground. You hear that? Even though they put him on the highest horse they had, his feet were almost touching the ground still. That's how tall Tuscaloosa was. He was a so-called giant. The general rejoiced that they had found wherewith to mount the cacique, gave his orders to march, and the army made four leagues each day. And on the third day, they arrived at the capital, which is called Tuscaloosa, from the name of the lord of the province. This town is strong because it is in the middle of a peninsula, which is formed by the river which passes by Talasi, and is much larger and more rapid at Tuscaloosa than at that town. The next day, they crossed the river, but because they had not rafts enough, they consumed the whole day in crossing and could not camp but as half a league from there in a very pleasant valley. There the Spaniards missed Villabos and another cavalier without being able to learn what had become of them. Only then they suspected that having gone astray, the Indians had killed them. Villabos in fact loved to leave the camp and travel over the country, where from this kind of excursions there ordinarily happened only misfortune. They began from that time to have a bad opinion of the friendship of Tuscaloosa, and that which confirmed this belief was that when the Spaniards manifested to the Indians their astonishment at the loss of their companions, the barbarians replied, All right, all right, dodge the hijack, see how he's calling them Indians, barbarians, with insolence, that they had not given them to their keeping, and that they were not obliged to render them an account of them. All right, so now there's some disagreements going on. He doesn't like Tuscaloosa anymore. He don't trust him. Tuscaloosa is like, hey, I never trusted you anyway. I'm only being forced to really serve you. The general would not push the affair further for fear of disquieting the cacique. And because he believed that Villabos and his companion were slain, he deferred avenging their death until fortune should furnish him an opportunity. So he was now plotting on Chief Tuscaloosa when he had a chance. The next day, Soto sent to Mavila or Mobila or Mobile, Alabama, right? Mavila which was a league and a half from the camp, Gonzal Cuadrado, Charamillo, and Diego Vasquez, cavaliers, experienced in all kinds of encounters and ordered them to reconnoitre the town and await him there. And it says here, chapter 6, the discovery of the treasury in Mavila. At the same time that Cuadrado and his comrade left, the general, took a hundred horse, as many foot soldiers to go as a vanguard with him and the cacique and gave orders to the colonel of cavalry to promptly follow him, all right? They mean in Tuscaloosa was still with them. Nevertheless, the rest of the army did not leave until late, and in the belief that they had nothing to fear, they scattered themselves here and there to hunt. The general arrived about eight o'clock in the morning at Mavilla, which consisted of 80 houses, in some which they could host 1,500 men and others a thousand, and in the smallest about six hundred. These houses, however, have but one main room, for the Indians do not make them otherwise, and each main room is in the form of a hall, with some small chambers. Besides, as Mobile is a frontier place, its houses are strong, beautiful, and indicate sufficiently the power of the cacique. The greater part also belongs to him, and the rest to the most important of his subjects. The town of Mabila is on a very agreeable plain and surrounded with a very high rampart, palisaded with a large pieces of wood fixed in the earth with beams across on the outside and attached within with strong cords. So the height of the pieces of wood was plastered with loam mixed with long straw, which filled the void between the pieces of wood in such a manner that it appeared a wall of masonry. There were every 50 paces, towers, capable of holding eight men, and embrasures four or five feet from the ground. There were but two gates at Mavila, one to the east, the other to the west, and a great square in the middle of the town, surrounded with the principal houses. Soto arrived with the cacique at this square, 
Tuscaloosa. Immediately dismounted and called Ortiz to show him the lodges of the general and his officers. He told him that the valets and other servants should take the house nearest to the lodge of the general and that the troops should camp outside at the distance of an arrow shot where very good huts had been made. The general replied that he must wait until his colonel of cavalry joined him and thereupon the cacique entered into the house where was his council of war. However, the soldiers who had proceeded with the general remained in the square and sent their horses out of town until they had seen the place which had destined for them. In the meanwhile, Cuadrado, who had been to reconnoitre Mabila, came to the general. He told him he must beware of the chief and that he feared treachery, that there were in the houses of the town nearly 10,000 warriors, all young men, brave and well-armed the flower of the vassals of Tuscaloosa, and the neighboring chiefs that many lodges were full of arms, that there were in Mabila only young women who could fight, no children, and that the inhabitants were free and unembarrassed, that to the distance of a quarter of a league around the town they had laid waste, which showed that they intended to fight, that every morning that they went on into the field and exercised in very good order, that to this they should add the death of Villaabos and the pride of the barbarians, and that therefore he was of opinion that they should hold themselves upon their guard. The general immediately commanded that they should secretly advise those of the men who were in the town of the treason, in order that they might hold themselves ready in case of alarm, and ordered Cuadrado to relate to the colonel of cavalry what he had seen. Carmona says that general was received at Mabila with great rejoicing, and that at his entry the Indians, the better to conceal their evil design, had ordered many women dances which were pleasant to see. For the Indian women are beautiful and well made, all right? You guys hear that? They tricked them with a little entertainment by the beautiful indigenous women that were very well made. In fact, that which Moscoso, all right, Luis de Moscoso, I have a future video on him, took from Mavila to Mexico was found so charming. All right, they're talking about a woman that he took with him. Was, she was so charming that the Spanish ladies in that kingdom often besought him to send her to them that they might see her. As to the cacique, when he had entered the house where his council awaited him, he said to his captains that they had no time to lose and that they must promptly decide whether they should kill the Spaniards who were in the town or wait until they were all assembled that he did not doubt of the success of the enterprise, whatever resolution they might take, because they had to do with but a small number of cowards and inexperts. But as to them, that besides being eight to one, they were valiant and experienced, that they might therefore boldly declare that they found proper to do, and that he awaited, but that to destroy his enemies. All right, so Tuscaloosa is ready to go ahead and battle and kill all the Spaniards and Hernando de Soto and all, all of them. Chapter 7 The decision of the council of the cacique and the beginning of the battle of Mabila. The opinion of the council of Tuscaloosa were divided. Some maintained that they ought not to wait to attack the Spaniards until they should be united because their defeat would be more difficult. Others that it would be cowardly to attack them when they were so few that they ought to defer the attack until they all should be in Mavila, and that they would have more glory in conquering them. To that, the first replied that they ought to hazard nothing, that the Spaniards being united would defend themselves with more vigor and might be able to slay some Indians, that the death of their enemies would be bought too dear if it caused them the loss of any of their men, that therefore it was important to attack them without further deliberation. This opinion prevailed, and it was decided that they should seek a pretext for a quarrel, and that in case they did not find one, they should not defer it, inasmuch as they had always a right to destroy their enemies. While these things were passing, the valet of the general who had prepared the dinner informed him that they were going to serve it, and he commanded them to tell Tuscaloosa, who had always eaten with him, that he awaited him in order to dine. Ortiz, who had received his orders, went to the lodge of the cacique to invite him to dinner, 
but was refused admittance, and they told him that Tuscaloosa was going to leave. He returned a second time and had the same answer. And the third time he said that Tuscaloosa might come if he pleased, that the dinner was upon the table. Then an Indian who had the appearance of an officer replied that he was astonished that brigands dared to utter the name of his lord with so little respect and to call him Tuscaloosa without giving him the titles which were due to him. He swore by the sun that the insolence to these scoundrels should cost them their lives and that it was necessary to begin from that day to chastise them. Hardly had this Indian spoken when there came another who gave him a bow and arrows to begin the battle. The barbarian immediately threw back the borders of his mantle over his shoulders, made ready his bow, and put himself in position to shoot upon a troop of Spaniards in the street. Gallego, who by chance met him at the side of the door through which he had gone out, seeing this treasury, struck the barbarian with the edge of his sword. Such a blow upon his shoulder covered only with his mantle, that he clove him even to the entrail, and he fell dead upon the spot, and he was going to discharge the arrow. This captain, just slain, had, on going out, commanded the Indians to charge the Spaniards. Therefore, the Indians rushed from all sides upon our men, and attacked with so much fury that they drove them more than a hundred paces out of town. Nevertheless, not a Spaniard turned his back. All fought and retired like brave soldiers. All right, so this is their account. Among the barbarians who attacked the first was a young man of distinction, 18 years of age, who casting his eyes upon Gallego, discharged six or seven arrows at him, but in vain, so that through rage at having neither wounded nor killed him, he closed with him and discharged with his bow three or four blows with so much force upon his head that the blood flowed from it. Gallego, who anticipated the second attack, pierced him with two trusts of his sword and laid him dead at his feet. They were convinced that the person killed was the son of the Indian captain who had lost his life, all right, and that the strong desire to avenge the death of his father had irresistibly impelled him to Gallego. But it was not only this young man who fought courageously, the others attacked with the same end or for the sole aim of them all was to exterminate the Spaniards. The cavaliers who had sent their horses out of Mobila ran immediately to recover them. The swiftest mounted the others had not time and cut their halters that they might escape the fury of the barbarians. But the last, who could neither mount nor set them at liberty, saw them severely wounded with arrows for the Indians, who had formed two battalions, attacked vigorously. One battalion, the Spaniards, the other the horses and baggage that was there. Afterwards, they carried the booty into their houses, and the Spaniards had only their lives left, which they defended like brave men. They, in fact, did on this occasion all that brave soldiers could do. Chapter 8. Continuation of the Battle of Mabila The cavaliers who had mounted their horses, being joined by those who had arrived in file, opposed themselves to the fury of the barbarians and advanced to succor the infantry, which was hard-pressed. The enemy gradually given way, our men assembled and formed two bodies, one of infantry, the other of cavalry. Then they fell upon the Indians with so much order and courage that they drove them back, even into their fortifications, where they would have entered pell-mell if those who were within had not showered upon them, from all sides arrows and stones. Therefore, our men retired, and the Indians sallied so quickly that many leaped down from the walls and approached the Spaniards so near that some of them seized the lances of the cavaliers. However, they did not gain any advantage. Our soldiers who fought in good order, having adroitly drawn them more than 200 paces from the town, redoubled their efforts and briskly drove them back. But as the barbarians incommodated our men, from the tops of the terraces, the Spaniards had recourse to ruses to induce them to sally and give the cavaliers an opportunity to pierce them. They therefore made many feints to draw them out, and as they succeeded, they repulsed them many times, but not without loss on both sides, for they vigorously opposed and attacked our men. Captain Gallego, in the skirmishes, was followed by a Dominican, his brother, well mounted, who begged him to accept his force, but the captain, who was foremost in the fight, 
and who was passionately fond of fame, would never quit his rank. Meanwhile, his brother, who was spurring on with another after him, was shot by an Indian, who wounded him slightly in the shoulder, because he had on two hoods with a large felt hat that flapped above. In these attacks, there were a number killed and wounded. Among others died Don Carlos Enriquez, who had espoused the needs of the general and was loved by all the army. This cavalier, among many excellent qualities, was generous toward everybody and personally very brave. Nothing touched the Spaniards more than his death, which happened in this manner. His horse, in the last attack, had an arrow shot in his breast, and immediately Enrique stood to draw it out. But as he turned his head a little to his left shoulder, he exposed his throat and received in that place an arrow armed with flint. He fell to the ground and died the next day. Thus the Spaniards and Indians fought, but they perished more on the side of the barbarians because they had no defensive armor. Therefore, after they discovered that the horses prevented them from conquering, they retired into the town, of which they shut the gates, all resolved to die upon the ramparts with arms in their hands. The general at the same time commanded the cavaliers to dismount because they were better armed than the foot soldiers and ordered them to take bucklers and axes and rush headlong to the crush in the gates of Mobila, which they bravely did, but not without suffering. Then they entered this town, and in the meantime the foot soldiers who were in the environs ran there in a great crowd, but as they all could not pass through the gates because they were narrow, and moreover as they would not lose the opportunity of distinguishing themselves in the battle, they struck down with the sturdy strokes of their axes a part of the palisades and sword in hand entered the town to the assistance of their comrades. Then the Indians, who saw their enemies masters of the town, fought with desperation in the middle of the streets. Okay, middle of the streets. All right, this is a town with streets. Just like today, a, a town with streets. And from the ramparts, whence they incommoded our men very much so that to prevent the barbarians from taking them in the rear and from regaining the houses which we had seized, we set fire to them. And as they were only straw, there was any moment seen nothing but flame and smoke, which served to increase still more the number of the dead and wounded. As soon as the Indians had retired into the town, many of them ran to pillage the lodge of the general, but they found there persons who repulsed them, three crossbow men, a well-armed Indian friend of the Spaniards, two priests, as many slaves and five of the soldiers' guard. Whilst the priests prayed, the others fought courageously, so that the enemy, not being able to gain the door of the house, endeavored to enter by the roof and made openings there in three or four places. But the crossbow men shot all who presented themselves. In the meantime, the general and his men arrived. They fell upon the barbarians who were besieging the house, put them to fight, and delivered those who were within. Then the general, who had already fought four hours on foot, left the town and mounted his horse in order to increase the fright of the Indians and the courage of the soldiers. Then he re-entered Mabila, accompanied by Tovar, and crying, Santiago, Santiago, or Santiago, right? They cut through the enemy, put them in disorder, and pierced them with many trusts of their lances. In the melee, as Soto raised himself in his stirrups to pierce an Indian, he was shot behind. All right, the soda was shot behind. The arrow broke his coat of mail and entered quite deep into his buttocks. All right, <laughs> he got shot in the, you already know. <laughs> Nevertheless, for fear that the wound might obey the courage of his men and elevate that of the barbarians, he concealed the wound that he had received and did not extract the arrow so that he could not sit down. All right, in the middle of his, you know, but talk. <laughs> he had an arrow. Picture that. They saw it all right. But he did not cease to fight valiantly until the end of the combat, which lasted five hours. Certainly, this action alone marks sufficiently his courage and his horsemanship. Ovar also had an arrow shot, which pierced through his lance above the handle. But because the wood was good, the arrow made only its hole so that the cavalier made use of his lance as usual after the arrow was cut. This shot is of little importance, however, I related it because the like of it seldom happens. 
In the meantime, the fire which they had set to the houses increased more and more and incommoded the barbarians even upon the ramparts. Whence the greater part fought, therefore, they were constrained to abandon them. The fire which they set to the doors of the lodge, each of which had but one, also did great mischief. Those who were within, not being able to get out, were miserably burned up. Many Indian women who were shut up in the houses where the fire was at the doors all perished there in this manner. All right, you guys hear what they did to the women? The fire excited not less disorder in the streets than in other places. Sometimes the wind drove the flame with the smoke upon the Indian and favored the Spaniards, and sometimes the contrary, so that the enemy regained what they had lost, and there were many persons slain on both sides. The battle so disastrous and so stubbornly contested during seven hours lasted until four in the afternoon. Then when the barbarians saw the number of people they had lost by fire and sword, and that their forces began to grow weaker and those of the enemy to increase, they implored the assistance of the women and induced them to avenge the death of many brave Indians, or all nobly perish. When they called the women to assist, some of them were already fighting by the side of their husbands, but as soon as they were commanded, they ran in a crowd, some with bows and arrows, others with swords, halberds and lances, which the Spaniards had dropped in the street, which they skillfully used. They all put themselves at the head of the Indians, and full of anger and hate, braved the peril and showed a courage about their sex. But when the Spaniards saw that they were no longer fighting except merely against women, and that these brave Indian women meant rather to die than to conquer, they spared them to such a degree that they did not wound one of them. In the meanwhile, the rear guard, which was advancing and amusing itself on the march, heard the noise of the drums and the sound of the trumpets and conjecturing what had happened, marched rapidly and in good order, so that they arrived even in time to give assistance. But no sooner had they arrived than Diego de Soto, nephew of the general, learned the death of Don Carlos, his cousin, whom he dearly loved, then he wished to avenge him. He leaped from his horse took a shield, drew his sword, and entered the town in the height of the melee. He was there immediately struck by an arrow, which passed through his eye to the back of his head. He fell to the ground and languished till the next day, when he died without they being able to extract the arrow. This misfortune was distressing to the whole army, and above all to the general. Diego de Soto was a cavalier truly worthy of being his nephew. The battle was not less sanguinary in the country than in the town. As soon as the Indians discovered that their numbers impeded them in such a small place as Mabila, because their skill was almost useless, many of them glided down the ramparts and gained the country, where they fought like brave men. Nevertheless, they had not more good fortune there than in the town. The advantage which they gained over the foot soldiers the cavaliers had over them and pierced them easily with the thrust of their lances, because the barbarians had no pikes. They also broke them many times, and then when the rear guard joined Soto, they finally put them to rout, and very few escaped. At the time the sun was about to set, and the cries and noise of those who fought in Mabila increased, there entered their party of cavaliers. Until then, no person except Soto and Tovar had entered there on horseback to fight for they could not there conveniently manage their horses. Therefore, as soon as these cavaliers were there, they divided into many small squads and raced through all the streets where they slew many Indians. Twelve of these cavaliers spurred through the main street where there was a battalion of men and women whom the spear had forced to fight. These cavaliers took them in the rear, and when they had broken them, they briskly drove them, at the same time overthrown pell-mell some of our men who were fighting on foot and killing these brave Indians, nearly all of whom died with arms in their hands, preferring death to servitude. It was by this last battle, which took place the day of St. Luke in the year 1540, that the Spaniards, after having fought nine entire hours without ceasing, succeeded in completely conquering their enemies. All right. So unfortunately, even though Tuscaloosa and, and the other Indians stood up and tried to get rid of the Spaniards, they eventually lost this this battle specifically. Uh, but they killed a lot of their men, so they had a lot of losses. They Soto did, and he had again an arrow in his buttocks. All 
right? So I wanted to give you guys a different version of this whole battle and the description of Tuscaloosa, of course, a couple of more sources on that. Uh, this book right here, this source is called The Discovery and Conquest of Terra Florida by Don Ferdinando de Soto, right? That's the actual, the real name is not Hernando, it's Ferdinando de Soto. And 600 Spaniards, his followers, right? So he went in, there were 600 soldiers. Remember, we got the slavery videos where they went in there straight to uh, get slaves and conquest. Written by a gentleman of Elba's employed in all the action and translated out of Portuguese by Richard Hallio, reprinted from the edition of 1611. All right, again, uh, from an original 1611 translation. Again, this happened in 1540s. So we go to page 70 of this book, chapter 17, how the governor went from Cusa to Tuscaloosa. All right. From Cusa to Tuscaloosa. That's where he was coming from, remember? It says here, the governor rested in Cusa 25 days. He departed from there the 20th of August to seek a province called Tuscaloosa, or as it says here, Tascaluca or Tascaloosa. He carried with him the cacique of Cusa, all right? He took the Cusa chief. He passed that day by a great town called Talimuchasi. The people were fled. He lodged half a league further near a brook. The next day he came to a town called Itava or Watava, subject to Cusa. He stayed there six days because of a river that passed by it, which at that time was very high. And as soon as the river suffered him to pass, he set forward and lodged at a town named Uyi Bahali. There came to him on the way on the Kasika's behalf of the province ten or twelve principal Indians to offer him his service. All of them had their plumes of feathers and bows and arrows. The governor come into the town with twelve horsemen and some footmen of his guard leaving his people a crossbow. Shot from the town entered into it. He found all the Indians with their weapons and as far as he could guess, they seemed to have some evil meaning. It was known afterward that they were determined to take the cacique of Cusa from the governor. If he had requested it, the governor commanded all his people to enter the town, which was walled about, and near unto it past a small river. So they were planning to take the cacique back of Cusa, like the chief, right? Because, again, Hernando de Soto was forcing all these chiefs to travel with him. But he didn't tell them to do it. He was like, no, don't worry. The wall, as well as that of others, which afterwards we saw was of great post thrust deep into the ground and very rough and many long rails as big as one's arm laid across between them. And the wall was about the height of a lance and it was daubed within and without with clay and had loopholes. On the other side of the river was a town where at the present the cacique was. The governor sent to call him and he came presently. After he had passed with the governor some words of offering, his services he gave him such men for his carriages as he needed, and 30 women for slaves. All right, so this is what the chiefs are doing. Remember, we've read this before. This the chiefs were given this Soto so they wouldn't be enslaved themselves, some of their slaves and some uh, other of the enemy tribe uh, people. So, you know, to help them as servants. And that place was a Christian lost called Manzano. All right, so there was already Spaniards, Portuguese, Sephardic Jews, Moors in these places before Hernandez de Soto that were standing there from different expeditions, guys. So this is one of them that says, in that place was a Christian lost called Manzano, born in Salamanca of noble parentage, which went astray to seek for grapes, whereof there is a great store in those very good. There's a lot of grapes in this region, huh? The day that the governor departed from thence, he lodged at a town subject to the lord of Uji Bahali, and the next day he came to another town called Toasi. The Indians gave the governor 30 women and such men for his carriage as he needed. He traveled ordinarily five or six leagues a day. When he traveled through peopled countries and going through deserts, he marched as fast as he could to Esho, the want of maize. From Toasi, passing through some towns subject to a cacique, which was lord of a province called Talisi, 
He traveled five days. He came to Talisi, the 18th of September. The town was great and situated near onto a main river. On the other side of the river were other towns, and many fields so with my ease. On both sides it was a very plentiful country, and had store of my ease. They had voided the town. The governor commanded to call the cacique, who came and between them passed some words of love and offer of his services, and he presented unto him forty Indians. There came to the governor, in this town a principal Indian, in the behalf of the cacique, of Tascalusa, and made this speech following. All right, so supposedly, remember, this is supposed to be written by a Portuguese who was in this expedition. And it goes on to say that the representative of Tuscaloosa said, Mighty, virtuous, and esteemed Lord, the great cacique of Tuscaloosa, my Lord, sendeth by me to kiss your Lordship's hands and to let you understand that he has noticed how you justly ravage with your perfections and power all men on the earth and that every one by whom your lordship passes does serve and obey you, which he acknowledged to be due unto you, and desire of his life to see, and to serve your lordship, for which cause, by me, he offers himself his lands and subjects, that when your lordship pleases to go through his country, you may be received with all peace and love, served and obeyed, and that in recompense of the desire he has to see you, you will do him the favor to let him know when you will come, for how much the sooner, so much the greater favor he shall receive. All right, so suppose that's what he told De Soto, right? So again, a lot of these Indians are just playing the role because they're afraid. They don't want their people to be, uh, you know, enslaved or killed, you know, by their guns and weapons. Remember, they had horses and guns and dogs. So they would comply just so they can go through their country and then they would leave them alone. Continue says the governor received and dispatched him graciously, giving him beads, which among them were not much esteemed, and some other things to carry to his lord. And he gave license to the cacique of Cusa to return home to his own countries. And then you see, he's like, all right, uh, he said to the chief of the Cusa, you can go now. Because now they had other servants, right? Remember that he was traveling with him for many, many days. The cacique of Talisi gave him such men for burdens as he needed, and after he had rested there twenty days, he departed thence toward Tascalusa. That day when he went from Talasi, he lodged at a great town called Casiste, and the next day passed by another, and came to a small town of Tascalusa, and the next day he camped in a wood two leagues from the town where the cacique resided, and was at that time, and he sent the master of the camps Luis de Moscoso, who with 15 horsemen, to let him know how he was coming. The cacique was in his lodgings under a canopy and without doors, right against his lodgings, in, in a high place. In a high place, he was on a mound, guys. They spread a mat for him, and two cushions, once, and two cushions one upon another, where he sat him down, and his Indians placed themselves round about him somewhat distant from him, so that they made a place and a void room where he sate, and his chiefest men were nearest to him, and one with a shadow of a deer skin, which kept the sun from him, being round, and of the beans of a target, quartered with black and white, having a rundle, in the midst, a far off it seemed to be of a tafata, because the colors were very perfect, and was set on a small strap stretched wide out, this was the device which he carried in his wars. He was a man of a very tall stature, all right? Here we go again. He was a man of a very tall stature of great limbs, okay? They're talking about Tuscaloosa. Very tall. Remember, he was a giant, two feet taller than even his son, who was taller than all the Spanish already. So imagine, we're talking about a seven-footer or eight-footer. So he was very tall, of great limbs and spare and well proportioned, and was much feared of his neighbors and subjects. He was lord of many territories and much people, and his countenance he was very grave. After the master of the camp had spoken with him, he and those that went with him coursed their horses, prancing them to and fro, and now and then toward the place where the cacique was, 
who with much gravity and dissimulation now and then lifted up his eyes and beheld them, as it were, with disdain, at the governor's coming. He made no offer at all to rise. The governor took him by the hand, and both of them sat down together on his seat, which was under the cloth of his state. The caciques said these words unto him. All right, so supposedly this is what Tuscaloosa said to Hernando de Soto. All right. Mighty Lord, I bid your lordship right heartily welcome. I receive as much pleasure and contentment with your sight as if you were my brother whom I dearly loved. Upon this point, it is not needful to use many reasons, since it is no discretion to speak that in many words, which in few many be uttered, how much the greater the will is. So much more giveth it name to the works, and the works give testimony of the truth. Now touching my will, by it you shall know how certain and manifest it is, and how pure inclination I have to serve you. Concerning the favor which you did me, and the things which you sent me, I make as much account of them as it is reason to esteem them, and chiefly because they were yours. Now see what service you will command me. The governor satisfied him with sweet words and with great brevity. When he departed from thence, he determined to carry him along with him for some causes. And at two days journey, he came to a town called Piace. All right, so they sort of forced Tuscaloosa to go with him. Again, he's forcing another you know, chief to travel with him. This is how he was able to travel all around, right? Protected, because these were their territories. So he landed in a town called Piace after two days, by which there passed a great river. The governor demanded canoes of the Indians. They said they had them not, but that they would make rafts of canes and dry timber, on which he might pass well enough. And they made them with all diligence and speed, and they governed them. And because the water went very slow, the governor and his people passed very well. From the port de Espiritu Santo to Apalachee, which is about an a hundred leagues, the governor went from east to west, and from Appalachia to Kutifa, Tiki, which are four hundred and thirty leagues, from the southwest to the northeast, and from Kutifa Chiki to Twala or Guala, Shwala, which are about two hundred and fifty leagues from the south to the north, and from Shwala to Tuscaloosa, which are two hundred and fifty leagues more, and hundred and ninety of them. He traveled from east to west to wit to the province of Cusa, and the other sixty from Cusa to Tuscaloosa, from the north to the south. All right, that's supposed to be the trajectory so far, they're saying. Having passed the river of Piace, a Christian went from his company from thence to seek a woman slave that was run away from him, and the Indians either took him captive or slew him. All right, you guys hear that? So this is why... They killed that other guy, Villabos. Remember the other story we got that Villabos just got murdered for no reason because he liked to wander off. Well, no, he was searching for his runaway Indian uh, woman slave. The governor urged the cacique that he should give account of him and threaten him that if he were not found, he would never let him loose. The cacique sent an Indian from thence to Mabila, whither they were traveling, which was a town of a principal Indian and his subject saying that he sent him to advise him to make ready victuals and men for carriages. But as afterward appeared, he sent him to assemble all the men of war, thither that he had in his country, right? So remember, Tuscaloosa was like, you know what? He was already not feeling him, remember? So he already had sent, you know, to warn and get ready, you know, for war against the Spaniards that would come into Mobila. The governor traveled three days, and the third day he passed all day through a peopled country. And he came to Mobila upon Monday, the 18th of October. He went before the camp with 15 horsemen and 30 footmen. And from the town came a Christian, whom he had sent to the principal man three or four days before, because he should not absent himself, and also to learn in what sort the Indians were, who told him that he thought they were in an evil purpose. For while he was there, there came many people into the town and many weapons, and that day, made great haste to fortify the wall, all right? So he's telling him, hey, while I was here, it seems like they were preparing for war. Remember, we read this on the other account, and, you know, you should be very careful, he's telling him. Luis de Moscoso told the governor that it would be good to lodge in the field, 
seeing the Indians were of such disposition, and he answered that he would lodge in the town, for he was wearing of lodging in the field. And so De Soto was like, no, I don't want to stay in the field, I'm going to stay in the town. When he came near unto the town, the cacique came forth to receive him, with many Indians playing upon flutes and singing. And after he had offered him, so he presented him with three mantles of martyrs. The governor with both the caciques and seven or eight men of his guard and three or four horsemen, which alighted to accompany him, entered into the town and sat him down under the cloth of the state. The cacique of Tuscaloosa requested him that he would let him remain in that town and trouble him no more with traveling. And seeing he would not give him leave, in his talk he changed his purpose and dissemblingly feigned that he would speak with some principal Indians and rose up from the place where he sat with the governor and entered into a house where many Indians were with their bows and arrows. This is when uh, Tuscaloosa went and gathered with his uh, army to get ready to attack the Spaniards. And remember, they were deliberating whether they should attack now or later. So this is what the part they're talking about because remember, he didn't want to let him go. He didn't want to travel with him by force anymore. And he's not feeling him really from the beginning. The governor, when he saw he returned not, called him. And he answered that he would not come out from thence. Neither would he go any farther than that town. So now Tuscaloosa is standing up for himself, right? And that if he would go his way in peace, he should presently depart and should not seek to carry him perforce out of his country and territory, all right? He said, I ain't going nowhere with you out of my land, out of my country anymore. Moving on to chapter 18, this book, how the Indians rose against the governor and what ensued thereupon. The governor, seeing the determination and furious answer of the cacique, went about to pacify him with fair words, to which he gave no answer, but rather with much pride and disdain withdrew himself, where the governor might not see him nor speak with him. As a principal Indian passed that way, the governor called him to send him word that he might remain at his pleasure in his country, and that it would please him to give him a guide and men for carriages to see if he could pacify him with mild words. The Indian answered with great pride that he would not hearken unto him. Baltasar de Gallegos, which stood by, took hold of a gown of manners which he had on, and he cast it over his head and left it in his hands, and because all of them immediately began to stir, Baltasar de Gallegos gave him such a wound with his cautilas that he opened him down the back, and presently all the Indians with a great eerie came out of the houses shooting their arrows. All right, so this is that part where Gallegos killed one of the Indians. Now we know why, because he was trying to force him to give them slaves. And he was like, no, I'm not giving you any more servants. So he killed them. And this is when the Indians really attacked with bows and arrows. The governor considering that if he tarried there, he could not escape. And he commanded his men to come in, which were without the town. The Indians within the houses might kill their horses and do much hurt, ran out of the town. And before he came out, he fell twice or thrice, and those that were with him did help him up again. And he and those that were with him were sore wounded. And in a moment there were five Christians slain in the town. The governor came running out of the town, crying out that every man should stand farther out, because from the wall they did them much hurt. The Indians, seeing that the Christians retired, and some of them, or the most part, more than an ordinary pace, shot with great boldness at them and struck down such as they could overtake. The Indians, which the Christians did lead with them in chains, had laid down their burdens near unto the wall. And as soon as the governor and his men were retired, the men of Mobila laid them on the Indians' backs again and took them into the town and loosed them presently from their chains and gave them bows and arrows to fight with all. Thus they possessed themselves of all the clothes and pearls and all that the Christians had which their slaves carried. And because the Indians had been always peaceable until we came to this place, some of our men had their weapons in their fardos and remained unarmed. And from others that had entered the town with the governor, they had taken swords and alibars and fought with them. When the governor was gone and into the field, he called for a horse. And with some that accompanied him, he returned and slew two or three Indians. All the rest retired themselves of the town and shot with their bows from the wall. And those which presumed of their nimbleness 
sallied forth to fight a stone's cast from the wall, and when the Christians charged them, they retired themselves at their leisure into the town. At the time that the broil began, there were in the town a freer, and a priest, and a servant of the governor, with a woman slave, and they had no time to come out of the town, and they took in house, and so remained in the town. The Indians being become masters of the place, they shut the door with a field gate, and among them was one sword which the governor's servant had, and with it he set himself behind the door, trusting at the Indians which sought to come into them. And the frere and the priest stood on the other side, each of them with a bar in their hands, to beat him down that first came in. The Indians, seeing they could not get in by the door, began to uncover the house top. By this time, all the horsemen and footmen which were behind were come to Mabila. Here, there were sundry opinions whether they should discharge the Indians to enter the town or whether they should leave it, because it was hard to enter, and in the end it was resolved to set upon them. Continue says here, chapter 19, how the governor set his men in order and entered the town of Mabila. As soon as the battle and the reward were come to Mabila, the governor commanded all those that were best armed to alight and make four squadrons of footmen. The Indians, seeing how he was setting his men in order, concluded with the cacique that he should go his way, saying unto him, as after it was known by certain women that were taken there, that he was but one man, and he could fight but for one man, and that they had there among them many principal Indians, very valiant and expert in feats of arms, that any of one of them was able to order the people there, and for as much as matters of war were subject to casualty, and it was uncertain which part should overcome, they wished him to save himself, to the end, that if it fell out that they should end their days there, as they determined, rather than to be overcome, there might remain one to govern the country. For all this he would not have gone away, but they urged him so much that with fifteen or twenty Indians of his own, he went out of the town and carried away his scarlet cloak and other things of the Christian goods as much as he was able to carry and seemed best unto him. The governor was informed how there went men out of the town, and he commanded the horsemen to be set it and sent it every squadron of footmen, one soldier with a firebrand to set fire on the houses, that the Indians might have no defense. All his men being set in order, he commanded an harkubus to be shot off, the sign being given. The four squadrons, every one by itself, with great fury, gave the onset, and with great hurt on both sides they entered the town. The freer and the priests and those that were with them in the house were saved, which cost the lives of two men of account and valiant, which came thither to succor them. The Indians fought with such courage that many times they drave our men out of the town. The fight lasted so long that for weariness, the great thirst, many of the Christians went to a pool that was near the wall to drink, which was all stained with blood of the dead, and then came again to fight. The governor, seeing this, entered among the footmen into the town on horseback, was certain that accompanied him, and was a mean that the Christian came to set fire on the houses and break and overcame the Indians, who running out of the town from the footmen, the horsemen without drave in at the gates again, were being without all hope of life, they fought valiantly. And after the Christians came among them to handy blows, seeing themselves in great distress without any succor, many of them fled into the burning houses, where once upon another they were smothered and burned in the fire. The whole number of the Indians that died in this town were 2,500, little more or less. Of the Christians were died 18, of which one was Don Carlos, brother-in-law, to the governor and a nephew of his, and one John de Games, and Men Rodriguez, Portugal's, and John Vasquez de Villanova, de Barca Rota, all men of honor and of much valor, the rest were footmen. Besides those that were slain, there were an hundred and fifty wounded, with seven hundred wounds of their arrows, and it pleased God that a very dangerous wound they were quickly healed. All right, so unfortunately, according to the primary accounts, it, you know, it was very uh, lopsided. 
a lot of Indians died, 2,500, and only 18 of their men died. Again, because they had armor and they had guns and stuff and swords. So, you know, and they were ready for battle. You know, this is what they did. They were conquistadors. Moreover, there were 12 horses slain and 70 hurt. All the clothes which the Christians carried with them to clothe themselves with all and the ornaments to say mass and the pearls were all burnt there. And the Christians did set them on fire themselves because they held for a greater inconvenience the hurt which the Indians might do them from those houses where they had gathered all those goods together than the loss of them. Here the governor understood that Francisco Maldonado waited for him at the port of Ochuse and that it was six days journey from thence and he dealt with John Ortiz to keep it secret because he had not accomplished that which he determined to do and because the pearls were burnt there which he meant to have sent to Cuba for a show that the people hearing the news might be the serious to come to that country. He feared also that if they should have news of him without seeing from Florida neither gold nor silver nor anything of value it would set such a name that no man would seek to go thither when he should have need of people. And so he determined to send no news of himself until he had found some rich country. All right, so I just want to add there that remember the pearls he found. A lot of those came out of the temple of Tolomeco. Remember the video I did recently? All right, a temple of pearls. Pearls all over the wall, all over the ceiling, and just all over all over the place so he was able to carry as much as he liked as much as the his men could so a lot of those pearls got lost in the battle is what they're saying so i want to go ahead and uh read from this book as well you know some more drop right here it says here this book is called the de soto chronicles the expedition of hernando de soto to north america in 1539-1543 this is volume one by Lawrence A. Clayton, Vernon James Knight Jr., and Edward C. Moore, the editors. The University of Alabama Press, 1993. And again, we pick up in the middle of De Soto's travels. He's coming from Cusa, who he just said from here, we went to the province of Cusa, which is one of the best lands that we came upon in Florida. All right, because he received them and all that, he's saying. And then from here, we headed south, drawn near the coast of New Spain, and we passed several towns until we arrived at another province that was called Tascaloosa, of which the cacique was an Indian, so large that to the opinion of all, he was a giant, okay? He was a giant. He was tall, guys. Tuscaloosa was a giant. He was about seven or eight feet tall. We're going to see what he, his name meant, too. A real live so-called giant he awaited us in peace in his town we made much festivity for him when we arrived in jousted and had many horse races although he appeared to think little of all this but we're getting other uh, information right other details afterward we asked him to give us indians to carry the burdens and he responded that he was not accustomed to serving anyone rather that all served him before okay the governor commanded that he not be allowed to go to his house, but rather that he should be detained there. As a result, he felt that he was detained among us. And because of this, he committed the ruin that afterward he inflicted on us. Because he said that he could not give us anything there, that we should go to another town of his, which was called Mabila, and that there he would give us what we requested of him. We headed for there arriving at a large river, Rio Caudal, which we believe is the river that flows into the Bay of Chuse. Here we had news of how the boats of Narvaez had arrived in need of water, and that here among these Indians remained a Christian, who was called Don Teodoro, and a black man with him, a so-called black man, huh? <laughs> they showed us a dagger that the Christian had. We were here two days making rafts across this river, during which the Indians killed a Christian, who was one of the governor's guard. They're talking about Villabos, remember? Remember, he only they only killed him because he was trying to go after his slave woman who was trying to free herself. She was an Indian. So this Christian got killed, who was one of the governor's guards. In a fit of anger, he, the governor, treated the cacique badly and told him that he was going to burn him unless he gave him the Indians that had killed 
the Christian. So now we're getting more of the truth here. He actually got really mad. He wasn't talking to him all polite like in the other accounts. He said that in his town of Mabila, he would give them to us. This cacique was an Indian who brought along many other Indians who served him. And he always walked with a very large fly flap, moscador, made of feathers, which an Indian carried behind him in order to block the sun. He arrived at Mabila one day at nine in the morning. It was a small and very strongly palisaded town and was situated on a plain. There were some Indian houses on the outside of the palisade, but we found that the Indians had demolished all of them to the ground in order to have the field more clear. Some important Indians came forth to us upon seeing us and asked the governor through the interpreter whether he wished to spend the night there or on that plain or if he wished to enter within the town and said that in, in the afternoon they would give us the Indians for the burdens. It seemed to the governor that it was better to enter in the town with them and he commanded us all to enter in there and so we did it. Having entered within, we were walking with the Indians, chatting as if we had them in peace because only 300 or 400 appeared there but there were a good 5,000 Indians in the town, hidden in the houses. We did not see them, nor did the Indians appear, as they made festivity for us. They began to do their dances and songs in order to dissemble. They had 15 or 20 women dance in front of us. After they had danced a little while, the cacique arose and entered one of those houses. The governor sent a message for him to come outside, and he said that he did not wish to. The captain of the governor's guard entered to bring him out and he saw so many people within and so ready for war that he thought it a good idea to go out and leave him. And he said to the governor that those houses were full of Indians, all with bows and arrows, ready to do some treasury. The governor called to another Indian who was passing by there, who likewise refused to come. A nobleman who found himself alongside him seized him by the arm in order to bring him. And then he, the Indian, gave a bull that set himself free. Then he, the nobleman, put hand to his sword and gave him a slash to cut off an arm. Upon wounding this Indian, all began to shoot arrows at us. Some from within the houses, through many looping holes that they had made, and others from outside. As we were so unprepared because we thought that we had met them in peace, we suffered so much damage that we were forced to leave fleeing from the town, and all that the Indians brought us in our loads remained within, as they had unloaded it there. When the Indians saw us outside, they closed the gates of the town and began to beat their drums and to raise banners with a great yell, and to open our trunks and bundles and display from the top of the wall all that we had brought, since they had it in their possession. As soon as we left the town, we mounted our horses and encircled the entire town so that the Indians might not get away from us on any side. And the governor decided that 60 or 80 of us should dismount, those of us who were best armed, and that we should form ourselves in four squads and assault the town on four sides, and that the first to enter should set fire to the houses so that they might not do us more damage from within and that we should give the horses to other soldiers who were not armed, so that if some Indians should come forth from the town in order to flee, they might overtake them. We entered within the town and set fire, where a quantity of Indians were burned, and all our supplies were burned, so that none one thing remained. We fought that day until it was night, without one Indian surrendering to us, rather they fought like fierce lions. Of those who came out, we killed them all, some with the fire, others with the sword, others with the lances, Later, near nightfall, only three Indians remained, and they took those twenty women that they had brought to dance and placed them in front of themselves. The women crossed their hands, making signs to the Christians that they should take them. The Christians came to take them, and they turned aside, and three Indians who were behind them shot arrows at the Christians. We killed two of the Indians, and one who remained alone and ordered not to surrender to us climbed a tree that was in the wall itself and removed the cord from the bow and attached it to his neck to a branch of the tree and hanged himself. This day, the Indians killed more than 20 of our men. All right, so remember the other book just said that only 18 of them died. So more than eight, more than 18 died. They're saying more than 20 of our men. So maybe a lot more died and then they just don't want to say, right? And 250 of us escaped with wounds. 
but we had 760 arrow wounds. We treated ourselves that night with the adipose tissue of the dead Indians themselves because we had no other medicine because all had burned that day. We stayed here treating ourselves 27 or 28 days and thank God we all healed. We took the women and divided them among the most seriously wounded in order that they might serve them. We heard through news from the Indians that we were up to 40 leagues from the sea. Many wished that the governor would go to the sea because they, the Indians, gave us news of the brigantines. But he did not dare for the month of November had already half over and it was very cold. And he felt it was advisable to look for a land where he might find provisions in order to be able to winter. In this land, there were none, because it was a land of little food. We turned again north and walked 10 or 12 days journey with great hardship from cold and from waters that we crossed on foot until we arrived at a province, well provisioned, gruesa, and with plenty of food where we could halt while the fury of the winter passed because more snows fell there than in Castel. I'm going to get this other account. Uh, we're not going to read the whole thing. We're going to just get a brief uh, description here again of the Soto. Uh, and from this book, it says Fernando de Soto and the uh, Explorers of the American South. This is by Sylvia Whitman. Introductory essay by Michael Collins. We go to page 83 of this book. And of course, pick up where he's leaving Cusa, right? And he's going down the Alabama River, it says here, near where it joins the Tom Bigby, the powerful chief Tuscaloosa sent messengers, his son among them, to bid the strangers welcome. Seated on a platform, on a mound in his village, all right, on a mound in his village, surrounded by his nobles, one of whom held a parasol to shade Tuscaloosa from the sun, the tall, all right, again, the tall, tall and sober chief impressed the Spaniards with his kingly indifference to their military parade. He spoke only to De Soto, who, despite a flowery show of friendship during two days in town, put the chief under guard. In answer to the Spaniards' demands for more carriers, Tascalusa promised them a hundred women when the expedition reached the town of Mobila, north of today's Mobile. De Soto's scouts warned him that the Mobilians appeared to be preparing for battle as they were busy laying in provisions and bolstering the palisade, a fence of thick wooden stalks bound by cane and plastered with mud and straw. Yet the chief's messengers greeted the Spanish with bread made from chestnuts. This was enough for De Soto to disregard the advice of his scouts and Moscoso, who warned him to be wary of a trap. Ever confident, De Soto decided to lead a vanguard into town, assuming that a show of bravery on the part of the conquistadors would be sufficient to cow the natives. So I just wanted to read that real quick again, just you know, so you can see many accounts of him being very tall. All right, going to go to this source now. Uh, this book is by William Sanders. It's called Conquest, Hernando de Soto and the Indians, 1539 to 1543. So over on page 123 is where, you know, he leaves Cusa. He goes into the other little towns on, on the way from Cusa to Tuscaloosa, which we read about earlier. It says here, while the troops were pillaging the granaries, right? They're taking all these Indians' food and granaries. Look at that. Of Talasi. And Soto was bullying the local chief into producing women and porters. So you see, when they write their accounts, they seem like, oh, they're so gentle. They're just requesting servants, you know. No, they're bullying these chiefs. They're bullying them into submission. Threatening them, you know, all that. So he's bullying the chief of the Talasi, taking the granaries. And he's trying to get, make them produce women for him and porters. A messenger arrived from the south. While all this is going on, a messenger. Who's this messenger? This was no Creek, but a long-haired, remarkably tall. Remember, this was Tascalusa's son they're talking about. He was tall, too. Remember that the Spaniards weren't even nearly half his size. And that Tuscaloosa was two feet taller than him. So again, remarkably tall young man of obvious rank and dignity. He was, he announced the son of the great chief Tuscaloosa, who was pleased to welcome the strangers to his land. Would the white chief like to come and meet him? The white chief certainly would. Chapter 11. Tuscaloosa is the first great North American Indian chief whose name is known to history. 
everything we know about him attests that he was worthy of the honor. Tuscaloosa, which means, guys, black warrior. Tuscaloosa means black warrior, Wakanda forever. Black warrior was a big man. He was a big man. He was a giant, seven or eight foot black warrior, so-called black. Yeah, he was Swarty, yes. Black Indian, yes. Black warrior. Couple colored tribes of America, Tuscaloosa, was a big man, tall and powerfully built. Biedema wrote that the Spaniards, not a tall people, consider him a giant. He was a giant, a fine-looking, well-proportioned figure of a man. Rangel said, and impressive of Baron. His age we do not know, but he had a son old enough to be entrusted with an important diplomatic mission. So the black warrior must have been in the prime of his life. The black warrior. When the white man first met him at a recently built town named Atahachi. Now that's the hijack when they say white. Remember, these were Sephardic Moorish people. A lot of these were melanated uh, Europeans and Spaniards, okay? So, but when they got to the town named Atahachi, he received them in great state, sitting on a kind of dais atop a mound. He was on a mound in the public square, dressed in a long cloak of feathers and a curious headdress like a Moors. Even though like doesn't mean it is like. And surrounded by tribal elders, one of whom held a kind of umbrella to shade his face from the sun. All of this was impressive but unnecessary. Tuscaloosa would have been recognized for what he was if he had come alone and stark naked. He did not rise to greet the white men, but sat looking down at them while Soto dismounted and walked across the square to greet him. Luis de Moscoso, seeking to intimidate him, led a group of horsemen across the square in a sudden mock charge. But Tascalusa merely gave them a single bored glance. Hernando de Soto must surely have remembered Atahualpa, but there was something here that Atahualpa had never possessed. After a courteous speech of welcome, which did not suggest that he or his people were in any way at the new arrival's disposal, Tascalusa invited them to an enjoyable banquet, which featured an exhibition of dancing that reminded the homesick Rangel of the dances of Spanish peasants. Then, in the evening, Tascalusa said that he had to be on his way. Soto had not meant to make trouble so soon, but he dared not to let this chief, whose realm looked so promising out of his sight, as diplomatically as possible, he conveyed to Tascalusa that he must remain with the whites and provide men to carry the burdens. Tascalusa reacted with incredulity and indignation. In the first place, he pointed out he was the chief here and he would come and go as he pleased. And in the second, he did not serve other men. It was for them to serve him. This was a surprising change from the easygoing Creek Mecos. All right, from the, the easygoing Creek chiefs who did whatever they sold to wanted. Soto had been dealing with. Nevertheless, Tascaloosa was far from the heart of this country in a small town where he could raise no useful force of warriors. And the white man had him at a disadvantage. Reluctantly, he at last agreed to do as ordered. But when... Soto demanded a hundred women and a large number of bearers. Tuscaloosa explained that he could not possibly produce such manpower in a little town like Atahachi. However, he could give them 400 men for now, and if they would go with him to his principal town of Mobila, he would provide them with as many men and women as they desired. All right, so you guys know the rest of the story. All right, so a different version of it. I just wanted to go ahead and read it to you guys as well. And we go to another source here. It's called Knights of Spain, Warriors of the Sun, Hernando de Soto and the South's Ancient Chiefdoms. And here they show some Spaniards burning some Indians, right? Because this is, remember, what they did at the town of Mobile when they attacked, you know, the Indians there. They burned them. This is by Charles Hudson. And I go to page 228 in this book. And we pick up where Chief Tuscaloosa's son, appears to De Soto and his company. It says here, while the Spaniards were at Talasi, Chief Tuscaloosa sent a party of emissaries to meet with De Soto. As these emissaries approached the town, De Soto ordered a contingent of horsemen to charge about and blow on trumpets to suitably impress them. Among the emissaries was Chief 
Pascalusa's son, a boy of 18 who seemed a giant to the Spaniards. Even their son was a giant. Listen, remember, but imagine his dad, guys. So again, we're getting different accounts that you guys can see in this account. They were actually blowing trumpets, right? And they're talking about his giant son who was 18 only. He was taller than any of the Spaniards in the entire army. The emissaries told De Soto that Tascalusa was ready to receive him and his army, and he wanted to know where they were going. They told De Soto that from Talasi there were two trails by which the army could reach Tascalusa. They suggested that he send out two Spaniards to go there by one trail and return by the other so they could pick up the trail that was most suitable. Chief Tascalusa would provide guides for them. De Soto agreed to this. One of the two Spaniards who undertook this mission was Juan de Villalobos, who was always the first to volunteer for any exploration. De Soto gave two instructions to spy on the Indians and bring back as much intelligence as possible. What De Soto may not have known was that Tuscaloosa had sent his son as a spy to learn what he could of the curious intruders. As a peaceful gesture, De Soto gave the Indians some glass beads, which they appeared not to value highly, and he gave them some pieces of cloth to take to Chief Tuscaloosa. Now we get the truth, right? Now we know that the whole time Chief Tuscaloosa wasn't trying to serve him. He was just kind of bullshitting him a little bit, you know, playing the game. And his, he had sent his son as a spy. This here at Tahachi. After resting in the central town of Talasi for 18 days, the Spaniards departed on October 5th and proceeded south in the direction of the Gulf Coast, presumably continuing their march toward Ochuse. They came to the Casiste, a pretty village alongside a stream, possibly in the vicinity of Silacauga, and they spent the night there. On October 6th, they came to the Cacha or Casa, a wretched village on a stream bank, perhaps Hatchet Creek on the boundary between the territory of Talasi and the territory of Tascaloosa. On October 7th, they, they bivouacked by the Cusa River, and on the far side of the stream, there was a village named Pumati, possibly near the mouth of Shoal Creek. On October 8th, they arrived at a newly built village, Huachapita, in the vicinity of present-day Huetumca. On October 9th, they crossed the Talapusa River. At the end of the day, they bivouacked in open country, a league short of Atahachi, the town where Tascaloosa lived, a recently built village in the vicinity of present-day Montgomery. De Soto sent a messenger to Tascaloosa, informing him that he and his army had arrived, and in reply he got a message from Tascaloosa saying he could come to hold court with him anytime he wished. The next day, De Soto sent Luis de Moscoso to Atahachi to inform Tascaloosa that the Spaniards were coming. Somewhat later, when the entire army reached the town, De Soto found Tascaloosa waiting under the portico in front of his dwelling, on top of a mount at one side of the plaza. A mat had been spread for him in front of his house, and Tascaloosa went and seated himself on two cushions, one above the other, which had been placed there for him. He wore a beautifully made feather cloak that draped down to his feet and on his head he wore a cloth wrapped like the Almaizar or Almaizar worn by Moors. Okay, so we got another account here. So he had a cloth wrapped in his head. So because something looks like something doesn't mean it is. This could be the original. Remember, this is a true old world. But is that only a Moorish thing? Either way, very interesting, right guys? He was a giant of a man, okay? He was a giant of a man. Remember, he was two feet taller than his son, who was also a giant to the Spaniards. So he was a giant of a man, strong and very powerfully built, and half a yard taller than the Spaniards. Half a yard taller than the Spaniards, guys. Come on. Half a yard. Who said he was as tall as Antonico, a gigantic guard of Charles V. All right? <laughs> Charles V's guard. He had a big bodyguard, right? This big, huge seven, eight footer. Antonico, who was probably swarthy. Tascaloosa was as tall as his son, but more strongly built. To Juan Coles, he seemed to have as much bone between his foot and his knee as an ordinary man had between his foot and his waist, and his eyes seemed as large as those of an ox. After Tascaloosa seated himself, his retainers took their places about him, forming a kind of courtyard around where he sat. Men of higher social standing stood nearest him, one of these men, always beside him, held a circular, 
sunshade on a long, slender pole. The shade was made of finely dressed deerskin, the size of a shield, and had neatly painted on it a white cross on a black field. The Indian who held it did so with a ceremonious demeanor, and it was said to be carried as a kind of banner when Tuscaloosa went to war. You hear this another description of what they were seeing. War flags, right? Army banners that Tuscaloosa used or his people used when they went to war. This was probably Mississippian equal armed cross, all right? It was in the form of a cross. You see, that wasn't brought by the Christians, guys. That's a big one right there. Major drop, perhaps in a circle. It reminded the Spaniards of the emblematic Maltese cross. All right, again, America's a true old world. This is where they got all that from. The Maltese cross. So now when they're saying these Moors, he's wearing a Moorish. What if they're seen in reverse? What if his people in ancient times went over to that side of the world and spread that culture over there? You know, they could have came back and said, oh, wow, look, this looks like Moorish stuff. Ish. <laughs> So it looks like an emblematic Maltese cross to them, also an equal arm cross, which was prominently displayed by the militaristic Knights of Rhodes and Knights of Malta. Okay? Where's the origin of all that? Tuscaloosa had the same emblem when he went to war, guys. That's deep right there. Tuscaloosa was a powerful, paramount chief who had many tributaries, and he was feared by his own subjects and by the people of chiefdoms on his borders. Reserved and dignified in his demeanor, Tuscaloosa appeared to have been this ascending in power. He was making overtures to the people of Talasi, who were wavering in their allegiance to Cusa. Tuscaloosa was evidently not at war with Cusa, but he was expanding his power, and he had caused the people of Talasi to become discontent. There is no question that Tuscaloosa was a paramount chief, but the farthest extent of his power or influence is not known. Likewise, the cultural composition of his paramount chiefdom is not altogether clear. His name is almost certainly a Chagta or Western Muscogean word. Example, Tasca plus Losa, meaning black warrior. Again, black warrior. Tuscaloosa, the black warrior. That's what it means. So-called black. The swarthy warrior. The negro warrior. Copper-colored warrior. Huh? But the Hachi River Creek ending of Atahachi would seem to be Creek or some other Eastern Muscogean language. Hence, Tuscaloosa's paramount chiefdom may have been multilingual as Rakusa and Kofita Cheki. All right. All right. So before we leave for the dismount, since we just read about <laughs> the Moors' uh, headdress, right? They're talking about like literally a turban or a, a wrap, a head wrap or a turban. All right, so I just want to emphasize that, again, America is a true old world. We had many different cultures here. Uh, people who traditionally uh, wore turbans for different reasons, not necessarily all Muslim, you know. But as you can see, this is an ancient Maya artifact. This is an ancient Maya artifact. And you can see he has like a head wrap or a turban. All right, we have another uh, form of this, as you can see here. Again, all this is ancient Maya. Okay, so we had uh, wraps here. Just want you guys to see different types of wraps. You know, Dr. Hijack with the colors, but different kinds of wraps. As the first one you see here, just like what a Moor would wear, right? So-called Moor. Many uh, different depictions of uh, American Indians with head wraps, turban type uh, headdresses. You know, again, some of these are from George Catlin's drawings. Okay, as you can see there, head wrap. And then we got a lot of the Seminole and uh, different tribes uh, wearing turban type headdresses. Okay, as you can see here, uh, this is from, <laughs> I got this screenshot from a seer. Because a lot of people say, well, why are you showing us Mongols, Kurimel? Well, look look at a seer saying that this is, this is a Moor. That's what he's saying. Indian of America was Muslim. He was saying that in this video. I took a screenshot. I'm not kidding. So again, a lot of uh, American Indians wore turbans. Uh, the Seminole were known to have different types of turbans. As you guys can see here in the, the bag, these two, these three. And someone into uh, Billy Bowlegs right here on the right. You can see his uh, headdress or turban. 
Okay. Another seminal here on the right. You guys can see like a wrapped turban type. All right. And of course, this is a. Uh, here we see another one zooming in. Going to the right. As you guys can see, his head wrapped. Looking like just like a turban that a lot of the Moors wore, or Muslims wore, right? Doesn't mean he's a Moor. And another type, the Iroquois woman. Her and her son got a little type of tur like turban on. Another Seminole right here with feathers coming out, as you can see. Some more Seminoles right here. Two Seminole men, you see their turban or head wrap, headdress. And a lot of the times they have feathers out coming out of this. Here we have a picture of Billy Bowlegs the third with his turban, right? And a feather. Okay. So let's not generalize when people wear turbans or something that people say looks like a Moorish turban doesn't mean it's Moors. Seminole, again. This is Francis Hishishago. Look at his head wrap or turban. And you can see very swarthy, melanated, copper colored tribes of America. You got his turban and his feathers. This guy right here in the middle with his turban as well, Seminole. All right, all swarthy people. This is Tom Tiger with his uh, <laughs> turban, I guess. Yeah, he's also a Seminole. Another image here. You know, just some different examples. I want to show you guys. Maybe you might not consider these the same, but hey, look at that. Head wrap. I've seen a lot of uh, Arabs and Muslims wear this as well. You know, you can see the two feathers on it. Another Catlin drawn. I've seen swartier versions of this guy. <laughs> but yeah, this is a head wrap. You can see with a feather coming down. Another example here. And a lot of different examples. As you guys can see, so Tuscaloosa wearing a type of head wrap or turban. It's not very surprising. It doesn't mean he was a so-called Moor. And, you know, some more examples. It's part of the actual Cherokee uh, gear. Eyes of Dutch the hijack with him, but yeah, this is kind of like uh, this is Cherokee attire. As this is how I found the uh picture, as you guys can see, like a turban, a head wrap, and finally, it says here the turban was a style of head covering favored by many of the Southeast Indian tribes who were located in the states of Florida, Texas, Louisiana, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. And here we got Touch E, Touchy who lived from 1790 to 1843 at Cherokee War Chief, it says, all right? Very swarthy, but you can see his turban. All right, he has a turban. So Tuscaloosa, who's a black warrior, that's what his name means, was a giant, also wore a turban or with feathers and feathered uh, cloak coming down. That doesn't mean he was a Moor. Let's not just generalize, let's have better understanding and understand that this is the true old world. We had many types of cultures and people here living in the Americas who most likely influence that to other parts of the world. Hope you guys enjoyed this little presentation. You know a little bit more uh, about Chief Tuscaloosa and what happened with him and Hernandez Soto and how he was really a giant, a literal giant, guys. Thanks for tuning in once again. Appreciate you guys taking the time to do that. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Wow.